fellow Centusians, this is Open Mic. We are back to our fourth and final segment of the program today. And we want to focus on the situation of the um, residencies uh, in exchange for the passports. We also want to focus on an antiquated law that we have faced with for years called the Aliens Land Holding License. Um, from talking to various individuals abroad, the, di the difficulty that most foreigners have, first of all, with the, team, the term aliens license. What they have been saying all the time, they are not from Mars. They are not aliens. They are human beings who want to do business. We live in, in a global village and we need to change these antiquated laws. St. Lucia is about the only country now that holds on to this alien's land holding license, which is utterly ridiculous because we need to open ourselves to business. We talk about the ease of doing business and that is the first hurdle. How can you do business with a person who is non-existent? The same way that we have talked for years concerning uh, the cost of bringing airlines, various governments have uh, criticized <coughs> various ministries for paying to come here. And it has been said over and over, no one can swim to St. Lucia from the United States. They are not even prepared to take a vessel. They want to fly here. Time is of essence. People have five, six days vacation a year, <coughs> like in the US, and maybe 12 days. So they got to get here quickly and get out. And on that score, I'm going to ask uh, my uh, guest today, uh, Mr. Peters, to give me his take on the alien's license situation vis-a-vis um, investments because he has been in that field, he has seen what they have done when a hotel comes in or apartments are being built. So John, yes, I yeah, pose a question yeah. to you. Well, I, I believe that this, the issue of the alien and holding license, um, issues of economic citizenship, all of these would point to how do we get out of the situation that we are in. Obviously, the alien land holding license is tied to creating opportunities for investment. And I, I have seen firsthand how this antiquated law and this antiquated system has affected development uh, in terms of in the hotel sector, the tourism sector specifically. Mm. I know the Bahamas has moved and they have changed the law. They have changed in the name of the law, as you said, because it really is not. Uh, the right term to use. It uh, doesn't convey, you know, that that <laughs> that embracing yes. approach that we are saying that you know we welcome in you and we define you as an alien. So it's it's sort of you know um, counterproductive in that regard. But there is need for that. Um, I I know that there are people who have waited sometimes four years to get an alien life holding license. I mean, four years I'm talking about yeah. people who have who are interested in purchasing yeah. property. And let me just stop you for a moment. Mm. I've repeatedly said that there's an old saying, strike while the iron is hot. Mm. When a man has to wait four years, mm. St. Lucia is not the only place yeah. to invest. Definitely and, they, yeah. and a decision made by a business person mm. to invest today mm. Mm. and now doesn't mean he wants to do it tomorrow. That's right. Being a business person, I, I talk from experience. There are many things that I wanted to do and you know certain obstacles have come up and i said and they, well maybe i just forget that and, th and, mm -hmm. and it gives me enough time to think to do something yeah, else yeah. probably yeah. not applicable to saint lucia mm -hmm. or not mm -hmm. applicable to creating mm -hmm. what i would call an economic stimulus yeah. so yeah. yeah that's right but, but on one good thing I, I note in the the recent tourism stimulus act mm -hmm. that there was some attempt to address the issue of land holding license okay more in terms of um, not, 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 not in terms of the law itself, but in terms of not paying for the license, I believe it is. Mm. 
Um, but, but I think that is a matter that has to be addressed. Yeah. Uh, if you want to create a culture of investment, or an atmosphere in which yeah. we are inviting people to come in, yeah. then the laws must follow. You know, John, I don't want to be naive, but we have enough bright people in St. Lucia, and we can also tap the resources of other uh, countries. Mm -hmm. If an individual wants to come into St. Lucia and there is a concern about a particular individual and we don't want to be discriminatory, it is so easy to prepare a well-documented affidavit, mm -hmm. 40, 50 questions which they have to answer, fill out and notarize. Mm -hmm. Once that is done, the people understand they have to live within the terms of the agreement. Okay, failing which the government has the alternative to do what they have to do. So, what is the big deal? Why? Well, I think I, I think there is. Is it that <laughs> is it the political will is not there? What is it? Are we still yeah. concerned that Saint Lucia should be for Saint Lucians? Saint Lucia, there there are hundreds of Saint Lucians working everywhere in the, in the world. They are in London. They in New York. They in in the in the, in the can Canada, I mean I don't understand what's going on. You know, we have to be able to live. You you take Trinidad next door, okay? Trinidad has an abundance of cash. You know, why can't we say, look at me? Here is what we have to do. Come in, yeah, and government themselves have to be more friendly, not only towards the investors but towards St. Lucians to educate them and say, look at me. This is the direction we have to go. Because if you have investment, everybody gets employment, mm -hmm. you know? I mean, you reach a situation now, the banks are tight for money, they're pulling in as much money as they can, they're not lending, you know? We have a situation at the Bank of St. Lucia today, um, where uh, Republic Bank wants to invest more and they want controlling interest and there are concerns of which direction they go. And I honestly don't see what is the hold up, because I mean, the, the people are here. There are shares that they can buy. You know, the Prime Minister can easily make a deal with them and say, okay, fine, um, we're tight for money now. We're going to sell you the shares. And, you know, uh, there should be some, if in, in 10 years' time, when we become liquid again and the San Lucia's want to repurchase the shares, we can put, you can put in those agreements. But, you know, to just sit back and just let these things fall apart, just as our infrastructure has fallen apart, we're going to end up in a very poor situation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. There is need for that level of proactivity. I, I do agree that um, it, it calls for swift action, it yeah. calls for decisiveness, and, and we have to move in that direction. Yeah. But, you, but you touched on the stadium a while ago, <laughs> and um, I mean, I have been at the stadium, mm. the George Odlum Stadium, to look at it. Uh, yeah, okay. When last were you there? Um, I was there probably about, uh, about a year ago. Uh -huh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And even at that point in time, I know it has worsened since then. Okay. But I'm, I'm raising this in the context of us in this economic time, and these are the realities that we have to face. Can St. Lucia afford to host the Commonwealth Youth Games? Because to hold the Commonwealth Youth Games, we have to refurbish the entire stadium in Viewfort, mm -hmm. which means that we have to change that whole roof. The whole roof is gone. Uh, when is it? When do the games? 2017. 2017. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh -huh. right. The budget for this year has no allocation related to improvement of any of the infrastructure related to, to that. So the stadium has to be refurbished in its totality. And when the St. Jude's, whenever they move out, probably ha sometime next year. Has to be redone. Has to be redone everything down there. All right. Your indoor stadium is not up to standard to hold international sporting events yeah. right there is no ventilation system yeah. there right you know it's a, it's a sweat box so you have to you have to deal with that issue um well down there you have your racing track you have a swimming pool that has to be built because part of these commonwealth games requires you to have a right. swimming facility mm. we haven't even started on the design far less the identification of the funds, far less the construction. So when you look at what it's going to cost us, mm. it's going to cost us a considerable amount of money, 
some tens of millions of dollars to be ready. Okay, question for you. Mm -hmm. Knowing all of that, mm -hmm. you know, hard decisions must be taken. Hard decisions must be taken? Yeah. <laughs> Should it not be say, look at me, don't waste the people's time. We will not be able to afford it. Let us take our meager um, resources and put them into areas that are more important now. Mm -hmm. Because what kind of money are you going to bring in even when the game's coming? A perfect example is Brazil today. Look at what is happening in Brazil. You had major strikes in Brazil. Mm -hmm. Why? Because the people, a great portion of people said the money, the billions mm -hmm. that were spent on stadium should be spent at the hospitals. You look at Greece. Yeah. Greece is where yeah. it is yeah. now because yeah. of, of the expenditure there. And, and, and you know, the place is derelict. Eh? Derelict now? Yeah. Uh -huh. so, so I'm saying that these are hard decisions that, yeah. that must be taken. When we have um, Bo Senshu, the although it looks okay, but there are serious issues with the actual stadium itself. I'm not talking about where the Taiwanese built, mm -hmm. but the stadium itself. And you look, what are we getting out of it? I mean, how much money are you going to prepare to put on pride mm -hmm. to say that we have a stadium, you know? And I think right now, what should be done with those stadiums is that an international organization should be called in and say, look at me, we cannot uh, run those things anymore. Please, why don't you take it over and let them promote it? And, and in fact, we need to see more facilities taking place. This whole idea of saying it's ours, it's just like a businessman holding on to a whole load of property he can ill afford, you know, and, and, and it's going to kill you. Mm -hmm. So at the end of the day, you're going to die anyway. <laughs> so why don't you do something mm -hmm. about it? But so it's a whole new level of thinking that okay. has to take place. But it, but it comes back to the final point that has to be made is, where do we go from here? How do we get ourselves out of this? Because you started off talking about the unions suggesting that government should take the lead in, in the cuts yes. and the adjustments before they, take the, they, mm. they, they accept that decision. Mm. But it has to be done in parallel. I, and I think that the approach should be that we let us work in parallel. Mm. I'm going to show you where I'm going to cut. And I'm going to show you where I'm asking you to cut. And let's do it in parallel. But you can't have a situation which... Asking one side. You ask one side without declaring your yeah. hands on the other side. I think the Prime Minister, in all fairness to him, indicated that the ministers would take a 5% pay cut, except um, the, the Governor General and the Judiciary. And you know, some people have voiced their objection, but I have to say this is part of the Constitution, mm -hmm. and I would definitely support the Prime Minister in that aspect mm -hmm. concerning mm -hmm. the mm -hmm. Governor General mm -hmm. and the Judiciary. What he said is that everybody, whatever cut it is, uh -huh. everybody except those. Yeah, yes. Yeah. Yeah. But, but I think what the unions are saying is uh -huh. that, look, before you go there, tell us overall, yeah. line by line item, uh -huh where you have shown a commitment to reduce expenditure. That, that's the core of the issue from what I got. Yeah, correct. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. And, and you know, the thing is this, that um, the, the union, and they have said it time and time again, there are areas besides the 5% alone will not cut it. I don't care what anybody yeah, says. That's well, just, uh, I don't know what to call it. I uh, can't find the word right now. But I think it has to be far more serious than that. Because there are a lot of, in, of what you call projects that are being undertaken, which are necessary, mm -hmm. but not that compulsory mm -hmm. at this I moment. Yeah. You know, I mean, as you, as you say, when you're talking, you, you're spending um, eleven million dollars on one bridge, eight million on another, nine, and you know, the, by the prime minister's own admission, um, the Bailey Bridge situation. He highlighted it, and I support him on that. But, you know, John, a lot of those bridges that are going up, you can actually look at, for instance, the shock bridge has to come up, okay? Mm -hmm. Now, we have to start showing and leading by example and say, how much money are we going to spend on that shock bridge? Mm -hmm. Are we going to spend another 12 million on it? Mm -hmm. I mean, why can't we say, okay, fine, we're going to put in two nice Bailey bridges, he admitted that in canneries, he put it down in seven days. I went down there. It's a lovely bridge. Now, even though we can get 10 years out of it, it will give us a breathing spell and which to operate. At least try it and let us see what it goes. Because 
You know, the ordinary man, when he hears 10 million for one bridge, 8 million for another, and he's checking 18 million, and we, can, we, we don't have work. You know, there are, other, there are areas in which you can put that money to work with, where it can produce something better in life, you know. So, uh, and, and also, there are areas of government that there is a tremendous amount of over-expenditure, you know. Um, you know, uh, as I said, Keith Mitchell just made the, the decision about the embassies, you know. And you know, the Prime Minister doesn't want to hear that, but he has to hear it. And he has to do something about it because you're talking, you can save 16, 17 million dollars straight off the bat there. So if he gets 26 million from the 5%, 16 million there, you know, you look at 46 million dollars, and I'm sure they can a few cuts, he can get his 76 million. But he cannot stick to his own ideas all the time and ignore what people are saying and say, well, take a 5% cut. Um, because they have highlighted an ordinary man taking a 5%, it's going to affect his light bill. You know, and that's a serious situation. Let me hear what you're <laughs> saying on that. Yeah. Well, well I, I, I would say that it has to be all embracing. Uh -huh. I would say that the expenditure cuts should be looked at across the board. Uh -huh. Issues like whether or not we could afford the Commonwealth Games hosting is a reality that we ought to face. And, and, and uh, I know there's a level of pride to hold such a game, but at what cost? You have to face the cost. You have to face the cost. And, and the reality. And the reality. Cost and reality. And reality. And reality yeah. you know, so it's a little more than, than just, you know, yeah. the fact that, yes, there is, in fact, some benefit of hosting the game, but look at the cost. Mm -hmm. And I think that, that is the approach that has to be, to be, taken. To be, to be taken and mm -hmm. to, be, to be pursued yeah. in looking at the exponential as a, as a whole. And it is collective. Every drop in the bucket yeah. fills the bucket. Correct. So every cent that you save, yeah. every dollar that you save, yeah. Is a contributor. You know what they say? A penny saved is a penny earned. It's a penny yeah. earned. Right. Fellow St. Lucians, we have now come to the end of our program. I want to thank you greatly for listening to us. We hope our contribution today has been meaningful and cast some light on what is taking place in our country. We need to save St. Lucia, bring it back on course, bury the animosity, and try to go forward in a meaningful way. John, it's very nice having you here. Thank you. And before we go, as just a final wrap up, a couple words. Yes, definitely so. Um, well, I, I will take a different tone. I'll take a spiritual tone because, yes. I mean, I'm a born again Christian. Yeah. Um, people may not know that I also function as a pastor of a church, which is okay. probably a, Fine. a surprise to many people. Yeah. And, and I want to just bring that spiritual dimension to it, that there is, in fact, a, a spiritual side in dealing with these issues. Yes. And um, that, that people ought to recognize that particular aspect of, of their lives mm -hmm. is critical in terms of bringing the country back in order. Mm -hmm. we, we have to start with dealing with our own spiritual lives. Yes. And, and, and ensuring that we become, indeed, what God expects us to be. Mm -hmm. I, am, I am fully persuaded that St. Lucia is indeed a, a, a light to the Caribbean, will be a light to the Caribbean, that St. Lucia is indeed blessed by God. I'm a firm believer in that. I'm fully persuaded in that regard. And what has been spoken concerning St. Lucia will indeed come to pass. There's, there's a role that St. Lucia must play within the Caribbean, within the Oasis. We are resilient people. It took a lot of resilience to come across to leave Africa in a boat and to survive. It took a lot of resilience to survive slavery. It took a lot of resilience to survive colonialism. So I want you know, the people not to lose faith, but to understand that they are here by divine appointment. And if we are here by divine appointment, we will fulfill what God has destined St. Lucia to be. And that's what I want to leave with people. The destiny is assured. And it will come. What God has promised will come to pass. Well, let us hope that your views come to fruition because I would like to see that myself. Uh, thank you so much.